have a slide changer. So when it gets boring, he'll, Stephen, start to change the slides faster. I was hoping, you know, my whole thing about this was I, want, I am so fascinated myself in concept cars that I wanted to try to give an overview of what's happened since cars were. So I've got about 100 years of these and uh, far too many, I think. But we'll see how it goes. If this gets boring, then um, we'll you can throw your pencils, but not toward the eyes, OK? Just, you can <laughs> signal your dis dislike. So the first one, this is the first concept car. It's called a Cadillac Osceola, named after a Seminole Osceola. Indian. Osceola? Oh, yeah, another thing. A lot of this stuff I got off the internet, obviously. And so it may or may not be true. So if anyone, <laughs> urban legends, urban legends. So, so if anyone knows more than I do about a particular car, which is going to be most of the time, you can, you know, just shout out with the benefit of the microphone what we have. But this is the first closed bodied car. And that was the concept at the time, because all cars had been uh, open yeah, until then. Yeah. You're going to mark in your little circle if any cars are of interest to you, because I'm going to go through these names, and you may or may not remember. And so you can, in the little circle to the left of the name, blacken it like you did for, for the SAT test. These are special pencils. And so, um, sure. Just don't throw them. Yeah. Okay. So as a result, Cadillac began offering closed bodies in 1906. And so uh, the first concept car. Hit it, man. So already, people are starting to hear and read about science fiction and worlds of tomorrow. So this magazine from, uh, when is it, 1929, May 1929, you know, they didn't have it all together yet, but they got the idea. They got the bubble top thing going. They got the whole, you know, floating in the city sort of aspect. So we'll go through the 20s real fast because there's only one slide that I could find. And this, it looks like it's backwards, but the, the woman is uh, got her, you know, looking back to reverse. This is... Uh, car by J.W. Earl, Harley Earl's father. Um, he figured uh, he needed to make some money, and he started making money by uh, uh, living in Hollywood, building props for the movie trade, chariots, stagecoaches, and buggies. And he also built these sculptured cars because industry executives and movie producers started to uh, uh, get wind of his talents. So really, from the 20s, I found very little uh, uh, activity except for J.W. Earl. Uh, let's move to the 30s real quick. This is a 34 Ford Brewster, considered by some to be the first Ford concept car. We'll see what Ford will be smoking in the 50s, because uh, <laughs> we have a big section on them. Uh, never went into production. 1933 Briggs. It says, what's this, a four-door Volkswagen? No, but Dr. Porsche <coughs> was in the USA shortly before designing his people's car, Volkswagen. The rear engine V8, Briggs car, was actually the prototype for the Lincoln Zephyr. So you could say that the Beetle was a ripoff of a pre-war Lincoln. So I had not seen this car before, but anyway, it's got that streamlined thing going on in a little Volkswagen, big dose of Volkswagen, I guess. Know this one? Yes. Inventor of the geodesic dome, also was a kind of a Renaissance guy, and he developed this Dymaxion car built on complicated scientific principles. But there were some uh, not so complicated principles at work also. A warning buzzer was installed to alert the driver when the rear wheel was likely to travel outside the tracks of the forward wheels. So I guess they got a lot of, 
this kind of swaying thing going on. Though not much heavier than a VW Beetle, the Dymaxion was nearly 30 feet long, too big for urban traffic. So despite the fact that it could make a U-turn in its own length, it was never to be because it was not road friendly. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Where? You maybe are going to mention this, but this car had rear wheel steering, not front wheel steering. If you can imagine how that would handle, they were very dangerous on the road. Wow. I I didn't know that. The car made a successful debut in July '33, but crashed at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> in a high-speed race with another car, due to unfavorable pu publicity, the project died. So in the 30s, they were thinking streamline and future, but anyway, this was a kind of a example of the, the whole um, aesthetic going on there. This is beautiful. This is from 1934. It's an Alfa Romeo 8C. 2300 VAT Coupe, really originally built as a, a Le Mans racer in 1932, but this is not the race car body. They stuck, uh, Alfa Romeo uh, decided to make a road going streamliner, and there it is. That car belongs to Bob Lee in uh, Nevada right now, and uh, this, this shot was taken at Pebble Beach, uh, where it, uh, it won several awards. It's real low to the ground. I have one more picture of it. Pretty cool. Um, the next one's called the Stout Scarab, 1936. Maybe uh, earliest known examples, example of what we know today as the MPV. Not only did it have unit construction, body, it had a Ford flathead V8 placed at the rear, driving the rear wheels through a three-speed transaxle. Featured independent suspension at four corners, and only the driver's seat was fixed. So I guess this was really revolutionary as well. The rest could be moved around or removed, and there was also a table. Just yell out. The rest of the furniture, excuse me, the rest of the furniture is what he called it inside the car were like um, chrome-legged lounge chairs. I have one and, more shot. Yeah, let's and they were not fastened down to anything. <laughs> oh, really? They were, no. You could just no. rearrange your room. Only the driver's seat was uh, connected to the car. So wow. when I went around a corner, everybody went flying. You know. <laughs> Nine units were built over the period 1934 to 39. Next, we have a famous one. You probably all know the Y job. What you may not know is it got its uh, moniker, uh, the Y job, because Harley Earl thought the letter X was overused with all of these concept cars coming out. But it's two-seater sports convertible. Uh, and like um, the LeSabre we'll see later on, he used this as personal transportation. He had a habit of doing this. Um, had power windows, concealed headlights, and the first electrically operated convertible top. The bumpers, the bumpers on this car are original as shown in this shot. The preceding shot uh, were adaptations of the 46, 7, and 8 uh, Buick bumpers uh, that uh, Harley Earl sponsored as a facelift for this car. And also, as originally designed, this car had covered rear wheels. With oh. The uh, chrome stripes going all the way went, through went the over rear the quarter. Skirts. Yeah, there you go. Down oh, the there left. on the bottom. There, right. there's one. And uh, we, the, they they adapted the uh, the open wheel design, probably so that uh, when he had a flat tire, he wouldn't have to mess around with the fender skirts. <laughs> uh, there was quite an episode at one point in time uh, where he uh, Harley was driving down to Florida. And uh, I think it was with the LeSabre rather than this car, which you'll probably show later here. Mm -hmm. um, he had a flat tire on the rear, and he pulled into a gas station and asked him to change the tire, and nobody could figure out how to remove the rear <laughs> wheel skirt. They tried. They put the thing up on a lift, everything else. And uh, what he finally had to do was to wire back to Detroit and fly 
uh, his personal mechanic down to remove the wheel skirts. And uh, if you look at the LeSabre, uh, you'll see that some of, the, some of the pictures have covered rear wheels and some of them have open. Mm. And this is the reason why. <laughs> Big trunk. Oh, the roof went in there between the... Next, the 38 Phantom Corsair by Rusty Hines, the Hines ketchup family. Um, let's see, I won't go through this whole thing. It was a front wheel drive, which had to be revolutionary for 1938. On a core chassis, had an electric gear shifter, and by the way, 290 cubic inch cord uh, Lycoming uh, V8, modified by Andy Granatelli verified by the internet. So, <laughs> so, God, who knows? Um, unusual thing is it sat four in front, four across. And so that was a wide car. I think it was known as the Wombat in some movie, right? Um, that particular car is on display over in Reno at the Harris Automobile Museum. And uh, they brought it over here to Salt Lake for one of the Concourse de Elegance's shows. And uh, I had an opportunity to ride in it. it was, really? Yeah, quite an interesting piece. Four beast. across in the front? Four across in the front, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was underneath the skin. It was an absolute piece of junk. It was just all like hand trashed together. Right. Sort of like one of Mark's models. <laughs> <laughs> rather, rather large blind spot, too, I think. <clears throat> OK, next. Uh, I got to find stuff that these guys haven't seen. <laughs> Try this, 1934 Ford Model 90 special road car designed by Edsel Ford. And um, Edsel Ford, as it turns out, was more an artist than an engineer, so he designed more by look and uh, seat of the pants rather than uh, from the inside out. But it did have a, a tube frame chassis. And uh, there's another version of it. Three iterations were made. This is one called the Ford Road Car. And this other one, very similar, is 1934 Edsel Ford Sports Car. Um, if I may, uh, this was really designed by Bob Gregory yeah, uh, uh, for Edsel, Edsel Ford. Ford. And they worked together I in conversation the, to create the designs. He was the sort of artist. Well, he, he, managed the, he, was the, uh, he was the Harley Earl of Ford. Bob Gregory was. Mm. This is an earlier version. Apparently. Yeah. And he drives it on the street all the time. Yeah, the guy who, uh, who organizes the Amelia Island concourse uh, owns the car now. So next we have a couple of concept drawings. I don't know who did them, but I found them during the course of my searching. And it just uh, shows kind of the um, ethic or the aesthetic that, that people were um, <coughs> um, trying to emulate in their cars. At the time, at the time this was, uh, these sketches were done, uh, the headlights were rather conventionally mounted uh, onto the side of the hood. And uh, I'm talking about the top sketch now. Uh, there was considerable effort throughout the industry, Chrysler, Ford, and GM, to get fender-mounted uh, headlights. And there was the interim, uh, the interim models uh, mounted the uh, headlamps vertically to the fender catwalk area in between the hood and the, uh, the rest of the fender. Mm. So, on to the 1940s. Here's uh, Ro Jeff. Roger. Yeah. Uh, just one comment about concept cars of the 30s. Uh, a, a car which I think could be considered a concept car uh, was the uh, Bud Stamping Company's attempt to convince Ford uh, to go into unibody construction. Mm. And it looked sort of like a Section 34 Ford sedan which they ended up selling to Citroën, which became the Citroën Traction Avant. Cool. That's great. I, um, I appreciate this because I, you know, I don't know this era very well. So continue. Um, this is from the General Motors Futurama. So you can start to see this whole urban perfection, science fiction kind of ethic is, is happening. And everyone's really uh, caught up in the future. 
Also, a, a note, I, you know, these are, are cars that I found interesting, but I, I don't have them all in here. I don't have, uh, um, for instance, the Batmobile. I don't have the, the, the Lincoln Futura. I don't have, uh, well, never mind what I don't have. Here's what I do have. Uh, familiar, 1941 Chrysler Newport, one of the last dual cowl Phaetons designed by Ralph Roberts and custom built by LeBaron Coach Builders of Detroit, featured an all aluminum body, folding windshields and hideaway top. Several, including this one, featured concealed headlamps. A total of six were constructed by Chrysler. Four still exist. Uh, and one of, the, one of them was selected as the uh, 1941 uh, Indianapolis 500 pace car. Uh, the first and only time a non-production car has been used in this capacity. Also, um, contemporary with it was the uh, 41 Chrysler Thunderbolt. Alex Tremulus designed um, the um, uh, designer of the Tucker. But get this, Imperial fans, are there a lot of Imperial fans? Remember him as the designer of the remarkable 1940-41 Chrysler Thunderbolt because the design was based on a 1940 Chrysler Crown Imperial frame. It was dubbed the car of the future, aluminum bodied, flush fendered, and a fully retractable electric top. Push buttons operated the doors, and it sported hydraulic windows. Total of five of these were built. Um, I think I have another picture. So there's that top again. Pretty cool. Uh, 1942 DeSoto Cyclone. It's just a concept sketch. I don't think it was ever built. Um, but it was all along this Thunderbolt and Newport era. And then, of course, along the, this tremulous theme, we have the Tucker Torpedo, which interestingly uh, looked like that in a uh, pre-production sketch. but you all know how things change when you actually get to build it in three dimensions. There's an example of a Tucker. But he envisioned it as quite a different sort of animal. And he did design a hot rod, which we'll see later on his uh, return to the, the car business after his dramatic exit. Um, it's unusual. One of these was built, 1948 Tasco aluminum bodied car um, based on a design by Gordon Bureg. Um, it was shown in Wichita in 1948 in the hope of contracting with Beach Aircraft Company for production. Um, they didn't bite and uh, it lies in a museum right now in the Auburn Core Duesenberg Museum. So there's just one of these that was built. Uh, the next one I threw in just for fun, it's not really a concept car. Oh yeah, the taillight is really something, I think. Plexiglass Pontiac 6, this was for the um, World's Fair. I just thought that was cool. The car still exists. Yes. Yeah? Wow. How did they do that? I mean, very plexiglass, carefully. very carefully. It's all back to work plastic. Amazing, amazing. So another cover of Motor. I could never figure out the name of this slide. It says Motor Science Show, oh, Service Show Number. So I don't know what that means. Service Any, Show Number meant that that was the, cat, the, the issue that they had for the, for the service show. The service Show Munder. So really, this is at the uh, 1950, and, and we were getting more and more space age as time goes on, but we can't go any further without going to Ford, <laughs> who uh, had quite a few ideas and was, I guess, the envy of the block. Concept sketch. So lots of stuff was going on. Lots of this is familiar. Next one is the 54 Ford Atmos, or the Ford FX Atmos, me FX for Future Experimental. Uh, what did it feature? Oh, needle-like antennae allow the car to be controlled by radio. 
and to facilitate an experimental radio-controlled anti-crash feature. Uh, it had a radar screen, one plus two seating arrangement, so I guess the driver sat centrally in the middle and two passengers behind. Uh, oh, McLaren did that, didn't they? The F1. Microphone. You left out one part. Uh, yeah. This car doesn't have an engine. There was never an engine in it ah. of any sort. Uh -huh. It was supposed to be <coughs> something futuristic, but they didn't actually have a design for the engine. So, There's a couple of those, <coughs> in, including a, well, I'll come across them. So no engine in that one. I wonder about the next one. It's a Ford Mystere. This had an engine. More extreme, although I don't think so, but anyway, the web says, more extreme was the 56 Mystere, at once the most amazing and most repulsive of dream cars. <laughs> its excessive chrome work, double headlamps, and heavy-duty accents appeared in production for its, for years to come, but mercifully, the bubble canopy, swinging steering wheel, and gas turbine power did not. So this had a turbine in it? Well, it's the web. What do, you, what do you want? I don't believe it did because the, the turbine technology. This was one of my favorite cars of the era. And I don't believe that it had a real uh, operating turbine engine in it. I think it was probably just a fiberglass shell. Mm. Um, <laughs> turbine t uh, engine technology had not developed at that point to where they could actually use it in a, mm. in a vehicle. You'll also note that the, uh, the body molding that starts over the top of the headlights or, or whatever mm -hmm. and go drops down over the door is the beginnings of the 1955 and 56 uh, Ford uh, premium body moldings. I've done quite a bit of research on this car. It did, it did have a Lincoln uh, V8 set midship behind the bubble. It did function, Ooh. but not well. Mid-engine, huh? Wow. Okay, the next one, uh, well... Yeah, the Ford X1000. X2000, sorry. X1000 is to come. Uh, a styling fantasy. This is what the Ford Design Department thought we might just possibly be driving in the year 2000. One of the, the most distinctive features that knows was not particularly modern nor plausible even back in 1958. The grill and hood are clearly related to those of the 57 Ford Edsel. In that context, the vertical oval mo motif was variously called the egg on end, sucking lemons, horse collar, impact ring, and other names that are more anatomical and even rude. <laughs> so, Rod but don't Roger? You I, yeah, yeah. Roger, the car in the bottom The car in the bottom was built from a 62 Mercury. It was built aftermarket by a guy, I believe, from Sweden who was caught in a fanciful mood. You'll notice that it is not the same as the car on the top. The car on the top is a 3-8 scale clay. The one on the bottom is something, it was, I think, covered in a collectible automobile or something a mm. few years back. But it's based, the bottom one is based on a Mercury. The next one I have no information on. It's a 56 Ford X1000. I couldn't find anything on it. Maybe there's a reason. I don't know. But uh, <coughs> it had many features. If my memory is correct, that was a plaster model only. Plaster model, yeah. probably 3 8 scale. And this was a model as well, the Ford Nucleon, a nuclear-powered concept car developed by Ford Motor Company in 1958. The trunk-mounted nuclear reactor used fuel that could be swapped out, and one load of nuclear fuel could purportedly power the car for 5,000 miles. What was Ford doing? I mean, what was the car never went into production, but it remains an icon of the atomic age in the 50s. There's two more here. I could find little or nothing about the 1958 Ford DePaolo on the upper left, and the 1958 Ford Maxima on the lower right. 
So go no, like they say. This is all very typical of Alex Tremulous' thinking. He had the advanced studio at Ford at that time, and they were getting in uh, fresh styling guys from uh, all the art schools and trying to orient them to uh, the industry a little bit at least before they sent them on to interiors and exteriors production studios. So this is just free wheel thinking, that's all. It has no, no real intent for anything other than uh, getting the designers oriented to the industry. Mm. On to the, <coughs> excuse me, GM and the Firebirds. Uh, that's one and two, and there was a third one. Uh, as far back as the 30s, it says GM had started research into turbine vehicles, but it wasn't until about 1950 that they actually started building them. So there were three Firebirds, each one more rocket-like, I guess, than the next. Uh, there's a turbine going into the Firebird II, so it was a real functioning automobile, turbine automobile. And on the next slide, there's the three, which uh, I think is, um, I saw on some A&E special on concept cars driving around. Now, both of these, the two and the three, were powered by or, or controlled by joysticks. So that is even worse than driving stick shift in England, I think, you know, because at least the pedals are correct in England. Sorry, anybody English here, I don't know. There is a, I, I'm the ugly American today, but I, anyway, I, I can't forget trying to drive a stick shift on a saloon car in England, you know, just shifting with your left hand is not, it wasn't a happening thing. All of these were skinned in titanium, by the way. This one had cruise control, anti-lock braking system, and constant temperature air conditioning. So. <laughs> It also features no conversation with the passengers. Right, that's true. That's good. Which was a that's good. a lot of husbands like. <laughs> so there's a family portrait. Family portrait, one, two, and three, uh, left, middle, and right. And a shot of the three at the uh, Motorama. It's a very space age kind of thing. Uh, next is a really famous one that everyone will know is the Le Sabre. Um, the body was made of magnesium and aluminum alloys and fiberglass reinforced plastics. Built-in hydraulic jacks allowed the driver to raise the car without leaving his seat. It's very East LA kind of, I mean, <laughs> maybe he invented it, I, I don't know, go no. The top closed automatically when a sensor in the center console dis detected a raindrop. Could I comment at that point, please? Break in. He had a car that had that feature. It may well have been this car at the, one of the golf clubs down in Florida when he was on vacation. He had a lot of his cronies with him the in the rest of the industry. And uh, the big clouds started coming up over the horizon. He says, now watch this, guys. And the car filled up with water. <laughs> He, uh, he called his, uh, his mechanic again from Detroit. Get that oh, son of a bitch down here now. <laughs> That's the skirts guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Probably the same guy. The I think he got, he got fired pretty regularly from General Motors. And when something went wrong, Harley said, well, where is he? And he said, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Roll, but you fired him last week. <laughs> well, get him back. <laughs> the headlight when you turned it on would uh, sort of rotate into position. When you turned it off, it would rotate back. I'm not sure what it looked like when it was closed. Was there like a grill? It was a vertical grill texture in there. Uh -huh. Yeah, very fine uh -huh. verticals, and slightly the, concave. And I included the bottom right shot because I only had the left one showing that, that rocket afterburner thing going on. But you get the full aero, Im jet aero impact of the rear end from the bottom right shot. That thing was really sculpted. Again, the same layout as uh, the wide job in that I guess the, the uh, retractable top went behind the two seats. Yeah, an interesting uh, thing about this car, there's a website um, about this car and about Harley Earl and uh, GM styling, um, he was uh, kind of upset with uh, 
with Europe after World War II. And if you'll notice the grill in the car, it's an upside down Mercedes star. And he purposely designed that as an affront to the Nazis. And <laughs> mm. that I've read in, in a couple of different places about the car when he, when he designed it. And they had a logo and everything that was, was all built around that. It's, um, I wish I could tell you the name of the website, but it's, uh, you might just go to mm. Harley Earl on Google. It's quite a story, and it leads to a whole selection of uh, stories about early GM styling. Next is uh, the Buick Wildcat, another GM thing. GM designers wondering what their um, brand new Corvette would look like as a Buick. Uh, says Chrome was everywhere. I, I think Chrome is uh, under those wheel wells too in the front. Uh, it was on the suspension. Um, and the taillight design on the Wildcat too was used on the production Buick Skylark. Uh, but this one ostensibly was built to use or, or to test the use of fiberglass in automotive bodybuilding. So I assume that's an entire fiberglass building, but uh, uh, body. But that's very Corvette-like, uh, kind of interesting. There's another one, uh, really. The 1954 Corvair, subsequent to the introduction of the Corvette, Harley Earl, vice president of GM Styling, put his team to work on three new show cars for the 54 Motorama. The trio consisted of a car based on the standard Corvette Roadster with the roll-up windows and bolt-on hardtop that would see production in 1956. A Nomad Wagon which led to the production version introduced in 1955, and this one named Corvair. So I did not know that it was a Corvair before it was a Corvair. The, uh, the Nomad looking version is actually built on a full size 55 Chevrolet uh, cowl structure, windshield, and all of that. It is not based on Corvette. Mm. Uh, even though the uh, front clip and uh, some of the tail light detailing does look a lot like a Corvette, uh, it's not the same. And it really raised Hobb when this car went through a restoration because the guy who did it didn't know what he had to start out with. Mm. Do you know if GM worked with any um, uh, European body makers? Because there seems to be a, a, a cross-pollination that starts to happen with Ghia and Ford. Bertone, all of these houses, and I see almost, I don't know, to me, you can throw pencils, but a, a European kind of uh, rear end. These um, three cars were designed by a guy named Bob Cattere, who later um, taught at um, Art Center College of Design. Oh. And there's a remarkable book that was put out in the in <coughs> mid-50s um, that featured some of these drawings and and some of the pre-production drawings of the 55 uh, Chevy with some very interesting bumper variation. But it's a lot of people think that if they build a model of it, the Nomad, they could just do it on a Corvette. But it's actually a full-size 55, as he mm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, R&D Unique offers a uh, resin body for the uh, Corvair. It's actually quite nicely done. Oh, I don't really? know who mastered it, but. Cool. A guy named Nicholas Whitlow. Okay, 1954 Oldsmobile F88, another Harley Earl um, uh, project, dubbed the XP20 project. Um, only one survives. It too is in the Auburn, Auburn Cord Duesenberg Museum. Um, and all I could find on it were hundreds of internal GM documents and original blueprints are still with the sole survivor. The so car they, actually was restored and just sold at uh, Barrett Jackson, mm. I think for around three and a half million. Yeah. And the guy donated it to an auto museum in Colorado somewhere. Is that it? Everybody was thinking Corvette. To, uh, to uh, answer your earlier question about did GM ever uh, take advantage of uh, European design houses to uh, build their show cars or to design their show cars, I doubt it very much. I know a fair number of people at GM styling and uh, I don't think that General Motors would have ever gone for that at all. They're too autonomous a group. Uh -huh. Designers as a whole, however, uh, given like problems, think for, with like answers and uh, 
they are influenced by what they see, that sort of thing. But uh, I think you'll find that most of the most, if not all, of the General Motors designs originated within the uh, tech center at uh, General Motors. You know, extrapolating that to to the the whole uh, automotive world, it's funny how trends develop and then people follow, and then you get a whole kind of uh, gestalt happening about the look of cars because. With a blank piece of paper, anybody could do anything, but they, you know, there's a look to a 40s car. There's a look to a 80s through, car. Through the 1950s, through the 1950s, uh, Chrysler used Ghia as, as uh, for a lot of their uh, building expertise, although Exner personally handled most of the designs of the uh, Exner show cars. Mm -hmm. But you will find that uh, throughout Italy at that time, there were a fair number of uh, cars that were designed an awful lot like the Exner show cars. Mm. We'll get to some Exner stuff soon. I know. Uh, Pontiac Bonneville, pretty, pretty Corvette. There's a couple of them, I think. Uh, one was, uh, one was a fiberglass car. I think it's off your mic. It's on. Okay. Okay. Uh, one was a fiberglass car, uh, to, uh, and that was the mule, and I believe that is the blue one. And in any case, the other one is a, uh, a more durable affair, and I, th I think it's sheet metal. Mm. It still exists, both of them. Genuine airplane instruments, I wonder. Two were built, both powered by four carburetors, straight eight engines. <laughs> Interesting. Um, also, Cadillac, not to be left out, had the LaSalle. Um, the front of the car is atypical of other Cadillac show cars of the 50s, although the small fender grills above the rear bumper ends appeared on production Cadillacs in 1957. The rear of the Cadillac LaSalle II show car emulates that of early Chevy Corvette models. It was an attempt by Cadillac to revive the LaSalle name, which had gone out of circulation. That's the 55 GMC Universelle truck, maybe one of the first uh, kind of uh, delivery vehicle uh, uh, trucks spawned from a more car-like origin. The futuristic styling influenced design in the 60s with the first compact passenger van from Chevrolet built on a Corvair chassis. OK, um, is this too slow? I think I'm liking this because I'm learning all of these things from Dave here, too. 55 Oldsmobile Golden Rocket featured a seating system in which a roof panel was raised, and the seat was elevated and rotated toward the entering occupant when the door was open. Buttons on the steering wheel allowed the column to tilt upward, allowing the driver easier access. This, too, was a fiberglass car. Um, instrument pod was in the center of the steering wheel. And I have a couple more shots of that. Um, next one is familiar. It's been before, kitted. Before you go to that next one, uh, note that the uh, that the uh, back lights are uh, extremely similar to the split window Corvette. Mm. Stingray, huh? Pontiac Club de Mer was kitted. Tried to stay away from cars that have already been kitted, but this is uh, interesting. All aluminum body, um, and it had a transmission in the back like the uh, old Tempests. Uh, headlights were mounted in the front grille pods and rotated into position when turned on. And the top of the fenders were less than three feet above the road. Is that, is that low? That doesn't seem that low. Yeah, that's pretty. Roger. Yeah. I, I find the tire interesting. The center has white stripe, much like the Yokohama, I think, the, yeah. that are uh, yellow and, and red, were they? Yeah, this is where that started. You were styling. My, my wall down the yeah, down the center of the tread. That's cool. And so for Jim, I think it's the 56 <laughs> Buick Centurion. Aerodynamic four-seat coupe with a patented rear-mounted television camera to provide the rear view to the driver. 
front seats automatically slid back when the doors were open for easier entry and also moved forward to provide entry and exit to the back seat. A cantilevered steering wheel positioned the steering shaft down the center of the car, allowing more legroom for the driver. This was a, an interesting car that was built by General Motors for the, for the Buick division. And at the time, they were experimenting with fiberglass as a, as a possible means of production. And it was also a time when they were, as some of the previous cars we've just seen, when they were using fiberglass to create the show cars. Um, General Motors um, put out a book on this, probably about 40 or 50 pages long. It was eight and a half by 11, horizontal, and it was a feature on how they built this car from, from start to finish, from the initial drawings in through clay models, uh, plaster, mm. fiberglass, how they made the body, how they did the chassis, the engine, the whole thing in the car. Um, if you find that book anywhere, I'll pay 100, 150 bucks for it. All right. <laughs> Okay, um, 58 Corvette XP700, a styling exercise, um, the double bubble roof, and um, had a special rear end of a ducktail type, which was incorporated in the regular 61 Corvette, but of course I have no picture of it. Um, the 59 Cadillac Cyclone, we're, we're nearing kind of the end of the... Uh, 59 show car, um, mounted in the nose cones was an early version of the crash avoidance system. Cyclone's radar sensing technology provided the driver with information on an object ahead, including distance to the object and stopping distance, both measured in feet. Uh, again, like uh, the, the LeSabre, when a sensor in the console de detected rain, it automatically put up the one-piece bubble top. Front mounted engine, rear mounted. Did it also phone the uh, fender guy from Detroit to come down the, and fix it? The, the, the skirts guy. Okay, off to um, Dodge, um, Chrysler Plymouth. Yep, 54 Dodge Fire Arrow. But um, now this was done with input from Gia. So uh, I know little about this car. Uh, Dave, you have... I don't know that I can tell you much more about it uh, yeah. with any, any degree of accuracy at all. It happened before I ever got to Chrysler, so, mm -hmm. uh, so be it. There were, there were a number of Gia-built show cars that resembled this between different Chrysler divisions, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was Plymouth, Dodge, or uh, I think there was even a DeSoto version of it. The, the next one is a car I had not seen before. Um, it's been around for too long. 54, <laughs> 54 Plymouth Belmont, two-seater, aimed at the Thunderbird and Corvette, but uh, uh, according to this one website, in typical Chrysler board mentality, um, the car and the design was retired before 1955 as being too old. Well, the, wh what happened was that uh, this car was designed by, uh, I think his name was Dave Scott. And he and Exner uh, did not have the same viewpoints on design, which is pretty obvious. Uh, and, and that's probably one of the reasons the car was retired early. It still does exist, by the way. And you'll note that the bumpers on this car uh, are production Plymouth bumpers uh, from that vintage. Next slide. And that was typical of uh, of a, of a number of the uh, Gia cars that were intended for uh, limited production. Uh, here's another one, D uh, 1956 Dodge Dart. A 1956 Dodge Dart. Again, with Gia. I would I would like to comment on this car, yeah. if I may, because this had uh, this was at Chrysler when I first started working there in styling, in February of '57. Uh, it was on the first floor, styling was up on the third floor, the top floor of our building. And uh, they were doing some, some uh, maintenance work on the car uh, for a uh, auto show uh, circuitry kind of thing. This car is actually a convertible. The front part of the roof will slide back underneath the backlight. And the entire C-pillar area with the roof slid back underneath it Wow. then lowers all the way down to make its own tonneau cover, in effect. 
and the, the uh, sides of the C pillar, the touchdown, all the way around the uh, back of the car, all of that, the sides in particular actually sprung out from just the natural shape of the roof panel there mm. as, the, uh, as the roof uh, was erected, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and then when it went back down, why it would, it would squeeze back into a, uh, a narrower shape. This car does exist, although in a much butchered form right now, where they made the windshield considerably more vertical and uh, ripped the, uh, the roof mechanism completely right out of the car and put a uh, production uh, Crico uh, soft top, convertible top on it, and the fins have been cut down by at least half oh, thank God. and very, very poorly done. Why? Uh, ask the guy who yeah. did it. I don't know. I know. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that they tried to do at Chrysler was to create a production version of this uh, in one of the car lines, whichever. And they had severe internal criticism at, in this era where you couldn't see anything from the driver's uh, seat uh, forward of the cowl line. Mm. The front fender dro dropped that. off so much you couldn't see any of it. Right. And if you'll uh, remember, take a, take a good look at a 55 or a 56 Ford with the big, long, straight front fenders. Uh, it was quite the, uh, the, the custom at that time to be able to see all four corners of the car yeah. from the driver's position. Anymore, Years. this is a non-issue right. in today's environment. Right. This was really a gorgeous car. The, uh, the body molding that goes down the side was actually bumper stock, and so it had a full peripheral oh, wow. bumper. Wow. 56 Chrysler Plainsman? Uh, I this, think is, this is, is another Dave Scott design, and uh, obviously of a different school of thought than, uh, than Virgil Exner. Yeah. And along these same lines, the uh, Imperial, the Elegance. This was a fiberglass pushmobile. <laughs> this is an Exner design. Yeah, it had no engine. It had a chassis, but there was no engine on it at all. So it ever wonder how those hideously ugly 62 Plymouth Valiants uh, got their rear end? So I think this was a This was known as a, as a half fast back. <laughs> <laughs> For real. That's just yeah. real. <laughs> the next one I found kind of interesting because after Tucker's demise, there was a rumor that he would come back. Uh, this is years late, 1955, um, that he would come back with this car, which I think only went this far. Uh, a, a magazine article, but it, it embodies a lot of the Tucker you know, the three headlights that turn and uh, the styling cues. So uh, there was no, nothing else I could find on this car, but I thought that was interesting. What is that? Uh, 1953 Hudson Italia. Why did I put that in there? Um, in 1952, Hudson was in the throes of their biggest post-war gamble, the Hudson Jet. Their chief styling designer, Frank Spring, had been given this assignment. Uh, he had le left Murphy body for, Hus for Hudson and uh, was unhappy because the final result after all his work was something quite too boxy for him. So I thought that was interesting to see what, you know, uh, starts off as a concept and ends, ends up as a road going. This piece. car was built uh, as a series of them. I think there were about, uh, what, 20, something like that. I, I, I can't say the exact number was built by Carrozzeria Turing in uh, Milano. Italy. So you see, there is this cross-pollination of European and I American. I said built by. <laughs> built by. <laughs> Not designed Not by. Not designed by. No, no, Frank Spring did the There's design. There's another iterate. There's another one. Go check that windshield. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> <laughs> Next one's the Packard predictor. I think this, I don't know. That may be the last Packard. That's a Dick Teague design. It had a brushed aluminum tambour roof, or it had brushed aluminum tambour roof panels, so I guess they rolled up. Um, swivel seats and a compound curve wrap over windshield and a reverse slope winch rear windshield. Okay. Bats, we all know about bats, 1953 to 1955. Bertone. Uh, built these on a um, 1900 chassis 
and tried to get as aerodynamic as possible. There were three of them that were famous, although there were more. Uh, this is the five. Next one is uh, the seven. And the nine, which had uh, gotten more conservative, really, than the other ones. But, but they're interesting footnote. If I may. Do. Um, this car was found in uh, the, I want to say, late 50s at a Pontiac dealership in the northern peninsula of Michigan sitting on the uh, used car lot. Wow. <laughs> really. Wow. And uh, the, uh, the fellow was not well-to-do at all. He had always admired the car when it first came out, and he finally was able to just barely purchase the car. <laughs> and uh, he restored it as well as he could. And it was shown at uh, Meadowbrook when he got through with that. And uh, he used to drive the car on the road. Uh, a couple of people that I know had been see had seen this thing bouncing down the highway uh, wow. in, in northern Michigan. Uh, all three cars are uh, currently in a, a collection, I understand, in Holland. Mm. But as you may know, this is Alfa Romeo's year, along with Pininfarina, at... Uh, Pebble Beach this summer, and all three are to be shipped and shown at Pebble Beach this summer. Uh, I highly encourage anybody who has any interest in the wild uh, forms to uh, to get a good look at that or, or follow any photography that comes out of Pebble Beach. Uh, a young man was given the chance to design these by the name of Scioni. His first name mm -hmm. escapes me at this time, but he was very modest. Franco. Franco Scioni. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. And uh, he, he was very uh, un unassuming type of fellow. He died very early in life, no longer living. Uh, but uh, Nuccio Bertoni was, uh, was very proud of, uh, mm -hmm. of what this guy was able to do for him. Mm. Oh, no, that went forward. Okay, that's the f uh, five. That's a seven. Interesting exhaust detail. This car was originally red. I remember seeing it in uh, Ernie McAfee's showroom at the Sunset Strip while I was going to Art Center. And it even raced once at the uh, Burbank Airport races. Wow. Bouncing along from side to side. Definitely not a race car chassis. <laughs> but it was, it was really beautiful. And, and uh, after that period in time, uh, it was purchased by somebody who decided he wanted to see out of the rearview mirrors better. Uh, for rear three-quarter vision, and they cut the fins off of it. Uh, at least two-thirds of them, if not fully. I've never seen a picture of, of what happened there, but Strother McMinn has told me that that's what happened to it. This is a recreation, believe it or not, of the f real fins, the way they, uh, they really were originally. And this hasn't been kitted except in 143rd? There is, yeah, I have a... Uh, 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 Provence Moulange made, made a, uh, a, a resin one of it, or a resin of it. Uh -huh. uh, there is also another, uh, well, it's a cottage industry, somebody or other, who has done it uh, also, made all three of them, as a matter of fact, on a single plaque in 43rd. And uh, I have seen a notice in the, I think, uh, one of the model car magazines, can't remember which one it was, somebody has cast this thing in South Africa in 24th scale as oh. a, a conversion kit. One of them? You mean like it's the, the uh, It's seven, the nine, I believe. The nine. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, part of this is to, to see if, you know, there's some cars that, that uh, I came across that, that are of interest and maybe they'd be great subjects. Uh, like the next one, which I had never, no, not that one. A, a Fiat Turbina. So they were kind of getting some rocket uh, science going over there on that. And this is an operating gas turbine race car, a one-off, yep. but it did race. Uh, engine itself used a two-stage compressor and a three-stage turbine. Now, I'm not sure what I just said, but I said it. OK. And, uh, Roger, there's some stuff in a uh, book by Jabby Krambach oh, on turbines. The F1 guy. 
Yeah, uh-huh. he did a book on turbine cars, and this car. There's a lot of. There's a chapter on this particular car in that. I mean, book. if you can research that, that'd be a kind of an interesting subject, anyway. Uh, the next one's also interesting: a '54 Fiat Nautica Boano, not Goano, <laughs> Boano, and it's really an experiment by Fiat. There was a, a van called the Multipla, which was the sort of precursor to the Volkswagen van, this sort of platform that you could uh, build stuff on top of. And uh, there it is on the bottom left. Uh, But this was an unusual car that sat six behind the front wicker seat in uh, uh, opposing other wicker seats. No roof. And uh, that's all I have on that one. (laughs) Yeah, that red roof is... That's Does it come with the umbrella? Aerodynamica. <laughs> okay, so we're done with the 50s for now. If, uh, throw pencils if it's going too slow or going through. 1960 uh, Plymouth XNR, Virgil Exner, with a Ghia fabricated body, um, powered by uh, 200 horsepower, and then on the website it said slant six question mark. Uh-huh. Sorry, uh, this must be a very early shot because it's got black tires on it and uh, the wrong wheels and all of that. It was probably taken just after Gia got through uh, building the body by the look of the uh, background as well. I think the site said this one was red. I'm not sure. It was it was fire red uh-huh. for sure. They used to st- uh, they used to store it in the uh, on the styling third floor at uh, Highland Park when I was working there, and they would run it up and down the uh, the hallways about once a month with uh, <laughs> straight through pipes and all that sort of thing. But this was a fast car. Exner, after he had had his heart attack. Uh, had the car shipped out to the uh, Chelsea Proving Grounds, and he was running the car well around, uh, easily around 125 miles an hour. Wow, and uh, the corporate doctor said, X, you damn fool, what are you <laughs> trying to do with you in your condition to drive that car that fast on the test track? Uh, eventually, uh, toward the end of uh, Exner's career, this car was sold to the Shah of Iran, and as far as I know, it is still over there in Iran. Mm. Uh, the Shah had a, uh, a, f- a really fabulous collection of uh, everything from Duesenbergs on through. And interestingly enough, about 10 years ago, more recently than that, um, uh, uh, one of the fellows in the uh, Ferrari club had been over in Europe and he said all of the cars in the uh, Shah's X collection are all for sale for American dollars uh, if you can get over there and give them greenbacks, they will open up the gates and let you out of the garage. And from there on, it's up to you to get the cars <laughs> out of the out of the country. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's what the that's what the hearsay story really is. The Shah also bought the next car that you're going to show up. Uh, Sixty-one uh, Chrysler. Uh, no, no, not this one. Oh. No, no. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the turbo flight. Yeah, billed as a dream car. Uh, it was a pushmobile, by the way. The futuristic turbine-powered <laughs> sedan may have just been a mock-up for auto shows. I wrote this. It possibly the first known sighting of a rear wing. Uh, do I have another? I have another slide of this. I think they got it wrong, though. I don't think it's providing downforce there. But it looked like a rear wing. Uh, that's a weird picture on the left. 65 Plymouth VIP. Interesting. So-called basket handle roof. Uh, not much to say about this. This is an Elwood Engel car. 67 Dodge Daru. Now, I'm not sure which is a duster or a Daru. Go to the next slide. I think this is the one that was designed by uh, Ron Perot's Imperial Customs. And I think that the form, the slide before was uh, from the Chrysler st- Styling Studios. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh oh. Ruh row. Don't worry, it'll be fun. We're going back to Ford. Missions on a Chevy too. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, we were there. We were there. Daru. Charger 3, that was kitted. It has an interesting sort of uh, few features, but uh, we don't need to dwell on them. The steering wheel kind of flipped out of sight, and notice the air brakes. Um, did I lose? Uh, <laughs> he's exhausted, right? <laughs> 62 Ford Mustang? No. No. It's a gyron. Where am I? Oh, oh. Yeah, this one had only two uh, wheels. And it had a pair of stabilizers that came down to uh, keep it up. Training wheels. Had air conditioning and a snooper scope made it possible to see uh, the road ahead of you in bad weather. Again, goes through that thing. The 61 Leva car. Um, Wheels, those are so 20th century. What you really want is the Ford Leva, the card that floats on a thin film of air. True, it can only go in circles on a custom-built track and has no luggage <laughs> space, but it has super jet exhaust and can seat up to one. <laughs> the Leva car is designed to permit ground travel in the 200 to 500 miles per hour range. Right. Uh, the Ford Seattle light, this one was interesting. Uh, they envisioned a power pod that you could uh, put onto the front of the car based on what kind of activities you were going to be performing with or in this car. That car was featured at the 1964 World's Fair in Seattle, hence the name Seattle light. Uh -huh. Front wheel steering, God. Okay, now the 62 Ford. Styling study. This was a tube-framed, mid-engine, four-cylinder test or, or prototype built by a pair called uh, Troutman and Barnes. And it was a race car, and it was impractical pr for production. But Ford went through so many uh, different, uh, 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 I don't know, attempts to get to the Mustang. The next slide shows a Gia study for the Mustang, you can see the horse in the front, which is very uh, uh, different. One thing about the Mustang, uh, one that was back there, there were actually two built. One of them was a fiberglass solid one, and the other one ran. And the one that ran was introduced at the, um, I think, 1962 United States Grand Prix and was lapped by um, Dan Gurney driving it. That's right. Wow. Uh, on the bottom is, uh, um, uh, rejected styling study for the Mustang. So they really did a lot of stuff before they ended up with the uh, original. <laughs> Vinny. The, the top car there was um, built by, I'm not sure which Italian body maker. Gia. Gia, yeah, on the Ford, using the Ford Mustang thing. Um, as a as a styling study, right? Yeah, it was custom built. Mm. Uh, the next one, I don't know anything about this Celine, which was, uh, you know, I had trouble. Uh, there was a, a another one they built years ago, and you couldn't really tell which was the back or the front either. Like in the bottom shot, it's very, I don't know. But, but this is a Virgil Exner study, and uh, he was really un, unhappy, evidently, with the, the factory kind of thing and went off to do his own thing. This sold recently for some ungodly amount of money also. There's, there's one example of it. But it's called a Celine, and it's, uh, I don't know what it is. It's, it, it, it seems French to me somehow, but uh, let's move on. This is cool. I never knew about this car. Okay, is it on now? Okay. Yeah. Um, when I was working at Ravel, we were always looking for new cars to, to build as uh, kits. And uh, at one point in time, I went out to Bill Cushenberry's place in North Hollywood. And they were working on this car, and we were considering doing it as a, a kit at Ravel. Um, 
and so I was in his office, and uh, he had a little coffee table there, and there was this beautiful styling book sitting on the table, put out by U.S. Steel. And, uh, and <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, Sid Mead. I don't know if look oh, look up SidMead.com, okay, and you he'll, it's he'll unbelievable. Pop up later. Yeah. He, oh yeah, he's got some fun stuff. But anyway, I'm sitting there looking through this book, which is a one-off thing from Steel uh, from uh, U United States Steel, which you can't find anywhere. Very limited production things, and he had one. And anyway, I'm sitting there looking through the book, and and f I was there for about a half an hour waiting for him to get off the phone with somebody. And and uh, when I was all done, we talked for a little while about doing the car and stuff. And then he says, "You really like that book you were looking at?" And I said, "Yeah, I kind of do." And he says, "Well, why don't you take it take it with you?" He says, "It's yours." Oh man! And I still have it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So do do you know if any references for this exist? There's a there was quite an extensive article about it in Carcraft magazine sometime uh, in sixty three sixty two sixty three. Because I think this would be a great scratch building project, a Rothian kind of. Well, it it great. inspired Roth um, later on. Was there and a Corvair engine in there or um, no engine? This, I'm not, it had an engine in the rear, but I'm not sure what it was. Yeah. But it was uh, quite, a, when I saw it, it was all done in um, wire form. And what Cushenberry would do is make it in wire form, and then he would cover it with panels, and then weld the panels together and sand Oh, them. interesting, interesting. 69 Buick Century Cruiser. They're still in the 60s, caught up in the jet age. Needless to say, this was one that never had a hope of production. Designed for cruising on automated highways, uh, swivel contour seats, a refrigerator and table, a TV set, and an entrance canopy that slid forward and upward, permitting doors on each side to glide ahead and allow passengers to enter. There's a lot of these sliding door things that have been tried over the decades. Hardly any have made it into production except for the van sliding doors. There's many of these concepts. Six, 68 Astro Vet. It's an exaggerated version uh, of uh, that year's all new Shark production design. Allegedly good aerodynamics were never proven. Uh, lastly, I have to close out the 60s, the Bobby Darren dream car on the left there. Uh, really ugly kind of praying mantis, put your eye out kind of taillight pylons. <laughs> Jim likes it. Uh, well, actually, you have this, a kit of it. This car was very nearly a kit was made of it. Oh my God! By by AMT, the Der the Bobby supposedly Bobby Darren's car. And it was built by this guy who had a lot of money, and um, <laughs> the craftsmanship on it was absolutely impeccable. And they used the finest materials and everything on it. They're, they cast the bumpers and stuff out of brass and, and, and uh, plated uh -huh. them. And I have a fun picture of me at home at the San Diego Car Show, Custom Car Show, in 1961, I believe. or 19, Yeah, it would have been the spring of 1961. And we had a car sitting, in, I think it was an old Cadillac, sitting in the middle of the floor there. And people could come up and for 25 cents or 50 cents, they could use a sledgehammer. We called it whack a panel And the money went to charity. Okay? Wow. And so <laughs> as the show ended, we took all the signs off and we put them around this car. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a photograph of me at home standing over this car with a sledgehammer <laughs> with the sign right there. It was an ugly turd. <laughs> In searching around for this stuff, I found a lot of arcane websites, including Bob Sifford's website, which I stole his hovercraft design from 1960-something from. And the other one I came across, I don't know what that is, some jet car to just wind up the, the decade. Uh, speaking of Sid Mead, Sid Mead is a, a futurist, a illustrator, and uh, hero of many, including me. Uh, he's done a lot of the uh, design consultation on, on science fiction movies. And I think he did a little uh, uh, with NASA as well, designing the interiors of uh, Skylab and uh, some of the other spacecraft. But this was done in the 70s, and it just, to me, sort of 
wrapped up a lot of the futurism, but still with a very glassy, chromey kind of aesthetic going on there. Sid, Sid Mead uh, came to Art Center um, as a pretty knowledgeable guy. He had done a lot of covers for science fiction soft, uh, soft cover stuff that you see in uh, Barnes and Noble and that sort of thing. Uh, so he knew how to illustrate pretty well, but single-handedly he revolutionized teaching methods and design uh, at Art Center uh, as a beginning student, which was a bit uh, tough for mm. some of the instructors wow. to take, but they yeah. were certainly open to Golden any time. and everything that, uh, that he could do. We had a very simple um, charcoal pencil first, uh, first assignment for one of the uh, industrial drawing classes that Strother McMinn taught. And some guys were doing a simple but very nicely lit uh, Steuben glass uh, drinking beaker, something like that in this thing that they would draw from life. Well, what did Sid do? He took the whole instrument cluster out of a uh, Model 810 cord, which is totally engine turned, lit it beautifully with the highlights popping out in the center and every single instrument done to the nine. Wow. That was his, uh, one of his first uh, early jobs and it just wowed everybody. He is a visionary and has a very active uh, website and uh, is doing lots of work still to this day. He has uh, recently, within the last year, had a very serious heart attack. Yeah. And uh, he, he's porked out in his later years. He's, he's way too heavy, and mm. he's trying to lose weight right now. He has recovered uh, pretty much, but he is, is not in the best of health, so he's taking it a little bit easy. Mm. He lives in uh, Pasadena, California these days. Even AMC was in on it for what they were worth, you know. In the 70s, you're getting more into this folded paper kind of uh, look for cars. But they did uh, invent that nifty kind of child seat belt, which I liked. That was interesting to me. Um, next is a Bertone Stratus, which, uh, if you go to the next slide, is the unlikely ancestor of the Lancia um, production car. I, I can't really see. You know, it's a stretch, but I guess in and among all the drawings and whatever, you could intuit such a car. Uh, it had no doors, the Stratos. It, it just had a big liftoff windshield that you got in, uh, I guess, like the Isetta or something. But this was kind of the heyday of the, the 70s uh, supercar. Uh, there's, there's one that follows the Ford coin. Before you get there? Yeah. Uh, this car, uh, the Stratos was originally designed as a show car, as you, as you pointed out. It was purchased by a gentleman in Spain and driven on the street for a fair number of years. Uh, he went through and uh, fairly recently restored it, and I think it's gone to the, through the auction circuit and uh, is now privately owned still. How, how they can make that street legal with one front door? I guess in Spain you can in do Spain, anything. I guess in <laughs> So this is a you know like kind product from Cor uh, Ford at the same time. So you know the, there's uh, that sort of uh, effect that you mentioned earlier. The the next slide I have no idea. This is called a Ford Megastar One. Its big point is its uh, front doors were 80 percent glass, but it remains the illustration. You know I I left it in because of the illustration and it sort of gives a little bit of the mood of the 70s, just like those automated highways things. Uh, uh, this is before side impact beams came, yeah. came out. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. This is why <laughs> Another car that went through a lot of iterations before it ever reached the road was the Ford Probe, uh, including um, this lower left, which eventually became the Sierra and the Mercure and, and that whole family of Those two cars uh, were, were the ones that broke the mold to get into soft type of designs mm. and aerodyna From the aerodynamics. the paper yes, right. design. Exactly. Ugly or not, uh, they, they, they really uh, revolutionized the, uh, the field of styling. Um, there's a couple of more of the latest. Uh, the next slide has, has the bloopier later uh, studies for that. Nissan. 
Um, and of course, we have to do this. This is the Bricklin. This is the DeLorean of the 70s. Uh, Malcolm Bricklin was a wealthy, uh, uh, what was he? It was built in Newfoundland, which I think, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. New Brunswick. And uh, Malcolm Bricklin was a millionaire, I suppose, because he threw, all, like John DeLorean, threw all kinds of money into this Bricklin SV1, stood for Safety Vehicle One available uh, in five different colors of fiberglass and no cigarette lighter or ashtray as an ecological sort of statement. Among the factors that doomed the Bricklin were a high price, built quality problems, especially with leaking gullwing doors, lack of confidence in its acrylic plastic body shell, and a poorly designed electro-pneumatic system for raising the heavy doors. So. Seems to me, Roger, that Bricklin also came back later on, and he was trying to promote a swashplate type of uh, engine. Oh, I don't. At know, some point, years later on. Can't keep those guys down. Um, you can't keep him down. He's back in business again right now, and he's working with the Chinese to import a really cheap Chinese knockoff of a Chevy design. Wow. And Can't he's wait. trying to import it into the United States. Uh, there have been quite a few articles about it in the business magazines. He also imported Yugos. Oh, boy. Power came from a 360 cubic inch V8. Wow. Um, some uh, miscellaneous cars. 1970 Cordoba de Oro. Um, a 1971 Ferrari. I don't know. I don't know if this is most of these, or if not all of them. I've tried to keep, you know, uh, not custom cars, but the cars done by the factories. I'm not sure about that one. And the Pontiac Type K, which had very interesting gullwing action going on. Uh, uh, correct. But, correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, Ferrari. Uh, Dave might know about this. I think. Uh, Chuck Jordan had something to do with that, and at the time he had a Ferrari Daytona, and they kind of mocked up uh, some body work for his Daytona. You're confusing. Are we on? Yeah. Uh, you're confusing maybe a couple of cars. Um, the, uh, the Pontiac uh, station wagon version of a Firebird down in the lower left uh, was done by a sketch, I believe, uh, from Bob Ackerman when he was at uh, GM Styling before he came to Chrysler. Uh, the Ferrari name that you are referring to in a car that had a similar adaptation done to this was actually uh, done by a guy by the name of Gene Garfinkel, who at one time had worked at uh, General Motors Styling and was a classmate of mine at Art Center. He's now deceased. But they, uh, they took a Daytona and they put a back end a lot like this on it. And uh, that car is still around somewhere, I'm sure. Wow. And it, it wasn't too successful, frankly. But it, it was done in, uh, with the help of uh, Luigi Cinetti, Jr., Coco Cinetti. Okay, we're getting there. Um, Sid Mead also consulted on the, the vehicles and a lot of the uh, scenery and buildings and, and look for Blade Runner. And so uh, he is uh, really uh, a trendsetter as far as uh, giving the future a look these days. Uh, the Chrysler Portofino, which is the ancestor of the, the familiar car we see still on the road. Um, this was the car that introduced the, the cab forward concept, uh, which eventually got into their whole line of cars. And again, there's these wild doors on the concept cars that never make it, but the butterfly kind of door is very interesting. That's the GM Aero, uh, done in 1982, supposedly one of the slipperiest ever made. Uh, experimental four-seater four featured sliding doors, front wheel skirts, hinged for access to the wheels and tires. <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> and a speed-regulated airfoil to reduce fuel costly or air turbulence. 
many of the design concepts are now evident in GM's electric car, the EV1. The little cap roof uh, is, uh, came from the, the Tech One show car that GM did and never made very good on it until much later. Actually, the uh, original Ford, excuse me, Mercury Sable picked up that design and I made a good production version of it. 83 Buick Questar. Oh boy, wouldn't I like to have this. 14 microcomputers and such features as laser key entry system, automatic system for level attitude and spoiler control, system sentinel to mount, monitor the status of vehicle system, a heads up display for speedometer and gauges, map and navigation system, automatically aimed headlights, theft deterrent system, road traction monitoring system, TV rear view mirror. I know why you're leaving. <laughs> okay, let's go on. 87 Pontiac Pursuit. Yeah. It's a little feeder. Uh, Cadillac Voyage. Let's see if there's anything interesting here. No. Four-wheel drive. Interesting. Uh, Pontiac Stinger. Uh, this had a modular body so that you could uh, put different panels in it and have a different sort of car. Also, speaking of one of the, the major uh, Italian design houses, the next slide is uh, Ital Design, who was doing all sorts of strange things back in the 80s. Yeah, um, making tall cars. Uh, the next one may be familiar. It's the Aztec, which was a show car which... Uh, I don't know, man. Big feature was, uh, it could, uh, it were, what was it? Two steering, double steering wheels. Now, what, what's up? <laughs> Do you want that? I, and the next one, uh, and last, is the Machi Moto. This is a six or eight person motorcycle car that you and five or seven of your friends. Yeah, real close friends. Okay, let's close out this decade. The Citroen Karen, K-E-R-I-N, by Trevor Fiore, who is Italian, I guess. Uh, Four-wheel steering. Uh, the driver sat in the middle with passengers on either side. Blah, blah, blah. And the, the 86 VW Scooter, which we, it's interesting. I've not seen that. So there's stuff going on in these car companies that, that hardly sees the light of day. Uh, what is that? Is that around, it's around Jim's house. <laughs> this one, the next slide is uh, Alfa Romeo. And I, you know, I lost the website. I wrote down Nuvola, but the Alfa Romeo Nuvola is a different car. It's a coupe, and I could never find this thing again. Nuvola, Nuvola, N-I-V-O-L-A, was the nickname for Nuvolari. Nuvolari. And I think, that's oh. what, I think that's what the name is that you're saying. Yes, but, but the Nuvola, uh, referring to Nuvolari, yes. is a coupe, and it's a different car. This, yeah. and, and but this it's, is correct, it's correctly what spelled N-I-V-O-L-A. Oh, Nuvola. Nuvola. Ah, thanks. I believe. Um, but I liked it. It was kind of uh, representative of a wild supercar kind of thing. Almost like the, I don't know, there's a uh, suitcase there. It reminds me of that Ford J car a little bit. And this is a Need for Speed game. Need for Speed game? Yeah? It's, yeah? it's, it's one of the cars? Yeah, all the other cars are, are real cars, but then they have wow. one of the, you know, the top cars. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real car. Um, BMW Columbus. Well, really, it was an Ital design uh, product also to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the discovery of America. So what Italy and uh, Germany are doing commemorating the United States, I don't know. But able to carry up to nine, carbon fiber body. Oh, that should be expensive. A V12, four-wheel steering. Never made it into production. Big surprise. Okay, and that's a six series styling study, which uh, is just one of the countless revisions, I'm sure. Uh, BMW. And um, the 1997 Chrysler Phaeton with double windshields, now power. 
um, individual climate systems, blah, 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 all the good stuff. 91 and 92, the GM hybrid van up there and the GM ultralight, which only weighed 1,400 pounds, uh, carbon fiber monocoque, uh, efficient packaging, three-cylinder, two-stroke engine. So this is uh, efficiency exercises. Is another one, the Oldsmobile Expression. You know, it's got power, everything, computer, everything. You don't want it. N 98 Cadillac Solitaire, which is a V12, kind of a strange uh, greenhouse, wouldn't you say? But They uh, built that car uh, as a show car. The Solitaire? Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is a Saturn concept. Oh, sure no, I'm a Pontiac? Sunfire, Pontiac Sun, Sunfire yeah. um, concept. There we go. The left one is called the Buick Cielo, and it had a three-panel roof. Sec uh, the roof was in three panels and slid along those arched rails and into the trunk. Uh, features suicide doors and uh, voice-operated controls on board personal computer. This is a GTO styling study, uh, no engine, 20-inch wheels. It was just a styling study. Uh, the next one is interesting, though. This is a Cadillac Evoque, and I, uh, E-V-O-Q, so I guess evolution or something like that. But, but you, you see the impression sketches that designers start with uh, uh, on the top, and they get a little more real as things go along. And there's the finished car, which, which is surprisingly similar to the sketches, which is, is not always the case. Um, it's interesting. This car had neon t has neon taillights uh, to uh, give better viewing from more angles, and a communication port. Will you get a load of this? I'm sure you'll want it for your PDA, enabling you to email, real-time news bulletins, stock updates, and other critical business information can be downloaded. Just just what we all want. Uh, right, but there's the one of the introductions of the car. This uh, car is, uh, excuse me, this car is uh, V1. Uh, that was masterminded by Kip Wasinko for Cadillac uh, to set a new generation of styling for Cadillac division to get them away from the Cimarron's and all of the other cheesy Opal type of derivatives that General Motors is slapping the name Cadillac on. During its genesis, when it was being built as the first show car, uh, I know Kip quite well, and uh, he told me that you would not believe the inertia, the resistance, and the uh, just flat-out opposition he was getting from people throughout the General Motors organization to get this car completed. But he's persevered, and now he's got a very nice position uh, at, uh, at General Motors in style. Huh. Wow. I like the ne neon taillight idea. Uh, Mer Mercedes van, an F100 van. I don't know why this is in here, but there it is. I have no explanation. I, obviously, it's. But but um, uh, are you below talking, it is the life jet. Are you talking about the uh, the two bottom pictures when you say this? No 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 no. I'm talking about the top picture. Top picture. Okay. The life jet, now that's very interesting. I don't know, maybe to some. It's considered to be a car, although by nature it behaves more like a motorbike, achieving the best of both worlds. Well, the life jet leans in toward turns like a motorbike to counteract the centrifugal forces. It can do this up to an angle of 30 degrees and at motorcycle speeds. Car can reach 130 miles per hour powered by an all-aluminum straight-four 1600 cc engine. Okay, so that's some Mercedes weirdness that's going on. And if that weren't weird, this is really weird. 
Rin speed is some really strange stuff going on there. I don't know. That's a 1998 Rin speed Ego rocket. So you can go look it up at home on your browser and learn all you like about it. Uh, I like the little Continental kit on that Fiat uh, Bravo that was uh, 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 marketed as a Fiat or is be going to be marketed as a Fiat, but it was designed by Zagato, which is another Italian coach builder. And this at the bottom, I don't know, that's just as weird as the Rin speed. Um, it's called a dare or a dare, and it's in there just for no real reason. Um, another Sid Mead, this is Sid Mead uh, Christmas card for this year, which you can go purchase online at his site. But uh, he's been working on this van project, I think is a pet project of his, and I thought that was a nice uh, illustration. So on into the 2000s, I think this is the last slide, and then we, can you quit it? The, the second, this is the last one? yeah, and then the, there's a second document in there with the rest of it. So how do you quit it? Yeah, I'm done with that whole document. So how do you do? And then we we'll go to the next one. This is just a, a, a illustration from the Coventry Design School um, in England, and it uh, this is current, you know, 2004, 2005, just a student drawing. But I thought it exemplified at least an attitude and a way to design. Um, uh, transitioning from this sort of illustration, which is done by hand and has been taught for many decades, into a more uh, computer kind of environment. So the next, I found an interesting site called Digimod. Uh, co. Uk, and uh, this fellow has taken it upon himself to uh, redesign all of these cars based on photographs. So this is all Photoshop. This is two dimensional, not three. But he's taken that photo and uh, had his way with it. Uh, there's another slide with two more examples of this guy's work. I think his name is Pete Smith. There's a, there's a little two-seater uh, convertible of that one at the top on the left, too, that I've seen in England. Oh, yeah? Yeah. This guy is its a labor of love. He has so many of these. So he's, here's another example. So, you know, he'll take wheels, make them big. And he's, but this is all 2D. So he'll start with a, just a two-dimensional photograph. Um, what else do we have? So Jeep, the Jeep Trail concept. This was done by Michael Castiglione uh, to try to break Jeep out of the mold they had been in, all of the Cadillac comment. Um, this has an interesting... Uh, um, feature taken from the, the GM high wire skateboard chassis, which we'll see a little bit later, in that the, dry, the steering wheel pod is by wire, so it can slide from left to right along the dashboard. So still, I'm not sure what's going on with that, like the, the Aztec, but, but it wants to, uh, <laughs> you know, like, here, you do it. Those pylons house the tail lights and some intercoolers, I hear. And it's got a weird kind of two in the front, one in the back seating arrangement. But it's a dangerous new kind of uh, urban mobility vehicle by Jeep. And they're trying, uh, trying like hell as well. Next one's familiar probably is a Ford Indigo, which is uh, uh, built pretty much with the ethics of IndyCar and Formula One design with carbon fiber, the, the, um, the body is aluminum uh, faced, or aluminum honeycomb faced with carbon fiber. There's a V12 in there and all sorts of power. A Raynard shifter. So it's really guys that loved racing and wanted to build something, you know, along those lines in a production sports vehicle. I think it has nifty doors, though. Can you go to the next slide? I think it has... Uh, yeah, it has those butterfly kind of doors. That's never been kitted, but that's sort of a mainstream Ford concept that was really, you know, pushed quite well. But I, I, yeah, it's it's got it's got it's got game, huh? 
Here's one that you may not have seen, the Ford MA. Next. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Designed totally on computer, uh, uses futuristic combination of materials, bamboo, aluminum, and carbon fiber. The car has no welds. Instead, 364 titanium bolts hold it together. Only a few parts are painted. There's no hydraulic fluid or industrial adhesive used, making it 96% recyclable. Has a no impact electric engine. Okay, we can move on now, I'm happy. Mercedes-Benz carving, F400 carving, and uh, its big feature is this wild camber action on the front wheels. They've designed tires to go with it. And it's, it came from the idea of carving, like skiing with these special skis making uh, uh, fast turns. So they're pretty spiffy in their little caps there. And there it is pretty, uh, it's kind of transformer-ish or Japanese or, you know, I, I don't like it, but it's an interesting idea. This you might like. I would like this. Now, the, the Suzuki Mobile Terrace is the terrace that was a car. Uh, next slide will show you the way the doors slide open, and you can have your sort of canasta poker party there. Next. That's what it'll look like, or something like it. Couldn't leave that out. Along with the Dodge Kahuna, which is pretty conventional uh, in terms of its technology, but it does put a new face on a, a factory surfer van. So there's a lot of retro stuff going on as well, especially Renault. You have the 50, which is next, the Ellipse, and the Zoom. I knew you guys wouldn't like that. Those are the same guys that were in the carving vehicle, I think. <laughs> Maybe they hire out for jobs like this. But this is an adjustable wheelbase car for all those crowded cities. We'll see one more thing like that. Uh, Lamborghini Concept S. And uh, again, nothing revolutionary um, except the uh, you know, refinement of the styling. And I thought it'd be interesting to see what Lamborghini was up to these days. Uh, we have the Bugatti Veyron, million dollar car with the W16 engine. Big valve job. 982 valves. <laughs> right, 1,000 horsepower, 250 miles an hour. Just There's a good die cast that has just come out of this car, 18th scale. Um, so here's where, we're, you know, the Lamborghini, the Bugatti, they, they were cars, but this is a new concept. It's the General Motors skateboard, the hydrogen fuel cell idea. Next slide has the real thing unveiled and uh, them putting this high wire body on top. There's only one big electrical socket, I hear, and uh, everything else bolts on. So on the next slide, there's a van, and uh, there's the... Um, the last one, uh, the car in the slide before, it has no tunnel, of course, because it's just sitting on that flat uh, skateboard. Now, interestingly, back in the 70s, Mr. Mead, Sid Mead, had uh, developed the self-same concept that it took 30 years for the rest of the world to figure out. So he really should be the inventor of this. So that winds up the 2000s. I think we're beyond now. And a couple of interesting cars are the uh, Audi RSQ. Audi RSQ. Oh, it's not advancing. Oh, there you go. From the movie. Interestingly, no tires, but four balls under there, allowing it to do whatever it does. And, uh, but I thought these were nice uh, kind of styling studies, butterfly doors and the works. Interesting. And another movie car is that Lexus uh, 2054, which uh, we don't know what's going on there. It's a, made for the movies, but I think they made a functioning 
one, something that drove. Um, Peugeot has had a, a bunch of uh, contests recently, annual designing contests. So we have one of the winners next, uh, Steven Schultz. Oh, no, 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 that's the Mazda Ibuki, which is like the next generation uh, Miata. But as you can see, all of this stuff is uh, uh, done on computer. This is three-dimensional uh, design. And uh, the designers are becoming very fluent in it. Um, what is next? Tiny trunk. That is a, a winner of one of the Peugeot uh, web-based contests. Just thought I'd show you that. Not much to say because it was never thought out beyond the appearance stage. And, and it was really, but, but to Peugeot's benefit, uh, it created a show car non-functioning show car from the winning entry uh, with glass and aluminum and whatever they could come up with. Um, Toyota is up to interesting things. Uh, MTRC, motor triathlon race car, uh, powered by four in-wheel electric motors. And this is meant, I love uh, video games it was designed with off-road racetrack and city streets in mind at the same time. Have you ever come across any uh, notations on what the tread design and the tires of that vehicle uh, were supposed to represent? They never said a word about it. I guess they would say way cool, but who knows? This one is even weirder. This is uh, the new winner of the Peugeot styling contest. This is called the Moonster. And again, I mean, Peugeot built this thing based on this fellow's contest entry. So to their benefit, they built this big metal thing. It's amazing. Um, we're just about there. Um, so here's 3D design. And, and there's a bunch of websites. I put websites on the bottom of this handout. And these are just, you'd be surprised at how many guys in how many countries are doing this stuff. Uh, this fellow's from France. The next one is from, well, the third one's from Egypt. This bottom one won some Volkswagen um, contest, motor trend design contest. I mean, there's a ton of work happening in 3D design now. And it allows a certain freedom in that once you've designed something, you can rotate it and color it and light it and do, do all this stuff with it. Uh, last interesting vehicle we have is this uh, strange thing, the Toyota PM. I'm sure, Dave, you really are one with this That's thing, the right? It's a PM. <laughs> <laughs> it was originally the I unit, which I think is on the next, uh, which is a one-person mobility, urban mobility vehicle. Um, but it's meant to be a personal vehicle. Uh, it's a new car for Greg Hutchings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my God. I don't want no comment. But it has an adjustable wheelbase and a color exterior that changes with what is the mood of the what? The passenger of what's going on in there. It's like the mood ring of cars. You know, when you see it red, look out. Look out. <laughs> So uh, I think that's, uh, there's a bunch of them. You can do a follow the leader thing where you can relinquish your control and the leader can sort of tag, you know, have his little train of follower PMs. So anyway, that, oh, and then what I wanted to do, I don't know if everyone's bored. You can throw pencils if you're bored. I thought we'd design a concept car real fast. And uh, if you want to do it, we can try to do it. But usually when I build a model, I, I start off with a sketch. And here's, here's one of them. Uh, a lot of stuff changed between one and the other. But um, anyway, I thought it'd be fun if, if people are into it. Uh, how many no's? OK, we'll do it. Um, yeah, that's a lot. OK, five minutes. Where's my markers? Do I have markers? No. 
Um, I had two, now they've disappeared. I've, I had two Expo markers here. Oh, here's some more. Okay, we'll use these. <laughs> Okay, and then I had a yellow one or a light one. You had a highlighter. I don't have a yellow expo. Yeah, there. Okay. Okay, let's do this real fast. Um, okay, got to stay away from that. I wish I could draw on this thing. Okay, where are we going to start? Um, corner of the room. Okay, we'll start with you. Um, type of car. Um, figure out a type of car. Personal car, utility car, race car. Race car. Huh? Race car. Race car. Okay. Um, race car. Is this going to work? I hope, so. I hope so too. Okay, race car. How many wheels? Uh, let's go down. You. How many? Six wheels. Wow. Um, okay. Let's see. I'm breaking down here. I'm really, this is like smoky eunuch. A smoky eunuch nightmare. Smoking eunuchs. Smoking eunuchs? So it's an Arabian. Smoking eunuchs. You know the deal. Oh, let's put a because I, I wanted an, an I wanted it a uh, narrower nose, but you can't have it anymore because I what the hell am I drawing here? <laughs> oh, we need uh, no power, just suspension on these. Okay, well this and then here's the ice chest and. Uh, Fully enclosed bodywork, oh. anhedral rear wing. Oh, thanks for telling me now that I have black on it. And very important, we put a shadow to give it the air of reality. See, see how real it looks now. Don't you like that? Wow. Okay, and then we'll put uh, the lucky number on it, okay? 13. And there you have it. That's my show. So we'll see this in the Yeah, right. This will be the last part for two years from now. That'll work. Good job.